Okay, so, sorry about that. Let's go back to Scott. Scott's question is, is there a way to scan for stocks showing a large movement in option buying? Well, Scott, in any search on power options, okay, whether you're, um, whether you're just looking for long calls or long puts, whether you're looking for credit spreads or debit spreads or so forth, we go into the search here, and what we're going to be able to do is look at the percent. There's two things you can use. The percent current option volume is what you're going to be focusing on. Okay, this is available in any strategy. There's also the percent previous option volume if you want to look for stocks that showed a large movement in option volume the previous day. Okay? But the percent current option volume, it's today's total volume across all expirations and all strikes compared to the 30-day average of that volume. So if the stock is equal, all things being said, let me, let me clear all the filters out for you, Scott, here. And let me just go to, uh, we're looking at long puts, right? Okay. So let me just force it to be one strike. And I'm just going to stick a standard expiration. Let's go to February. Okay. 100 is even. 100% 100 option volume is even. So if I want to see stocks where the option volume today was twice as much as the average, I'm going to go ahead and look for a percent current option volume of 200%. Okay. That's across all strikes. And that is across everything. So now I can see stocks where there's large option buying. And I don't have the, the one selected here, but we see Intel, um, Aspen Insurance, General Mills, for example, Zilnex, Philips. Let's add the column in for today. Okay. So I click Add Columns. And what do we want to see here? I want to see the... Not the volatility, where is it? There we go. Percent, oh, shoot. Percent current option volume here. I'm going to add that in so we can see that. All right, so let me just go ahead and submit and save. All right, so the percent current option volume we see now with different percentages here. It looks like 872 is the highest, and that's for Aspen Insurance. Okay, all right, so let's take a look at the stock research tool here. Oh, wow, that's interesting, isn't it? So today, there was 5,328 put contracts on Aspen, two call contracts. The total is 5,330. So the average over the last 30 days is probably somewhere in the couple hundreds. Something really, really peaked here. And the stock's only down 21 cents or so. Earnings aren't coming out until February 6th, but there was a large jump and put volume in this case. So yeah, you want to check out the put volume of the stock volume. The total open interest is, wow, 13.25. Heavy. It's a lot of puts being there. Okay, so but that's the highest one today as far as percentage goes for total option volume because a large number of put contracts came in. It was almost double, triple the total open interest from the day before. Interesting, very interesting. Um, General Mills is up there too and Intel. So that's the filter you want to use. It's percent current option volume, or you can use previous from the yesterday's close, previous day's close, excuse me, to see that number as well. All right. Okay, so that's that. But remember, if you wanted to look for stocks, there's an average stock volume and percent stock volume. So you could look for the stock volume as well in order to see uh, high volume stocks, but the percent current option volume, percent previous option volume, is the one that you want to have uh, with you there. Okay. 
All right, so let's scroll through some of these questions again. Okay. Okay. Bruce had a question um, that I'm uh, going to address here. Bruce says, I sell put spreads. I'm assuming we mean bull put credit spreads. How do I find the best stocks to do this? And we just had a lengthy, we just had a few webinars, I don't want to say lengthy, a series of webinars actually. Uh, credit spreads, the basics, you can move beyond that one, Bruce, but then credit spreads beyond the basics part one. This is where we talked about the expectations, the structure, the criteria, trading plans, most important position sizing to look for to be successful. And we started with bull put credit spreads. Part two, we delved into the bear call credit spreads as well. Okay. One of the most important things that came about in those webinars for the bull put credit spreads, Bruce, in addition to what we presented last year regarding bull put credit spreads and finding the best bull put spreads, is that this weekly bull put credit spread criteria that we have as a default uh, actually performed better than a monthly screen using the same criteria, um, different criteria that we used, and also looking for positions that only had one week to expiration. We found that 8 to 17 days is the sweet spot. You could make maybe 73 to 75 trades per year following that pattern. And even with half of 2018 being a negative market, it still had a positive, reasonable, expected percent return doing bull put credit spreads. Of course, we would apply management as well. What strike prices are the best for this kind of trade? I found that going greater than two strikes or more, 50 cent strike differences don't last long term because eventually you take losses and because you took so much little premium up front, sure you're only risking 50 cents, but you take so little premium up front that every loss you take on a 50 cent strike difference or a $1 strike difference wipes out 20 to 25 trades. You can't be successful with that long term. You'd have to be right 95% of the time in order to make that profitable. That's 93, 94%, I can't remember. But that's the risk with trying to do a one point spread. You only get seven or eight cents up front, maybe 10 cents if you're lucky. But if you only get eight cents and you take one full loss from a sudden movement, and if there's a sudden movement, it breaks through both strike prices. You're at the full loss of a dollar. You just wiped out 15 to 16 previous wins. Okay. It's better to use wider strikes and get a higher net credit. Because even if there is a swing, you might only drop below the low strike or maybe between and not breach the lower strike. So we take in 30 cents. It only costs us a dollar to close it. Take a 70 cent loss, but that only wiped out two previous wins roughly in that case. So in my opinion, that's the best strike prices. The other reason why I like to use two strikes apart or more is let's say I open this bull put on IBM with stock at 129. I'm sorry, the stock at 133. Selling my 129 put, buying a 127. If the stock falls and threatens my 129 by keeping a strike apart between them, I have the ability to buy to close the 129 and maybe roll down to the 128 without touching this one and still be able to profit. If I do a one point strike, I don't have that management opportunity. I have to move the whole spread if it's being threatened. But if I leave two points apart, if the stock starts to move down here to 129-ish or so, I may have the ability to buy to close, oops, sorry. May have the ability to buy to close the 129 and just sell the 128 and still have a profit with a little bit more cushion for the next day or two. With a one point strike difference, I have to move the whole spread once it's threatened. Extra commissions, probably rolling farther out in time. Okay, and then you say, how do I find the stock to make the most profit with the least risk? This is sort of a loaded comment. And what I mean by that, why am I seeing these stocks like IBM, ISRG, UNH, Shop, URI, Adobe, these all look like uh, 
well-known stocks, familiar stocks. Why are they coming into the list? Well, what we found out, and we did this over a three-year time period when we showed the results last year, we did it just over a one-year time period this year. These stock criteria of looking for stocks that are in an uptrend have a positive MACD crosser. Of course, you always avoid earnings between now and expiration. These stocks here, what they end up doing is performing better, meaning neutral to bullish positions. It's not worth it, Bruce, to find the position, the spread that has the highest volatility to sell or to buy. Why? Because keep in mind that when you're doing a spread, you're selling a put and buying a put on the same stock with the same expiration, which means what? If the sell option is overvalued, so is the long. You're still probably only looking at a 20 or 30 cent credit on a two point spread with something that has an implied volatility of 0.5 or 0.7 and something that has an implied volatility of 0.3 because the long option is just as much overvalued as the short. So the spread combination, what is the stock to make the most profit with the least risk? The risk isn't controlled by the stock, the risk is controlled by the strike price selection. The amount of risk you're taking between the two strike prices in the worst case scenario. Looking for a higher implied volatility just means that, yeah, your short option might be higher, but so is your long. Okay? You know, right here, it's not, that's not a great example. Oh, it is. Let me do this real quick. On our search, let me change this here into the fundamentals. Stock price between 108 and 120. Remember, these options are all looking for, this search is looking for all 8 to 14 days out in time. Okay. Oh, shoot. Okay, that's a little bit different. That isn't a fair comparison. I thought there were more in there. 105 to, I need to go up to about 135. Actually, I could probably go 120. I was looking at the strike price, not the stock price. My apologies. Let's get it. Here we go. There we go. Why did I bring this up? didn't include the one that I wanted. I'm going to go back to 115. I'm sorry. Oh, let's go back to 110. In any case, where I'm going with this is that you can see we're near two similar strikes here for United Rentals, URI, and Splunk. 112, 118 in that range. Stocks at 127. Nine points out of the money. Here were ten points out of the money. Here were six points out of the money. But take a look. The premiums on the short option are sixty to seventy cents for Splunk and URI. It's only forty-three cents for UTX. But because of the fact that they're on the same stock, yeah, it does look like URI and Splunk are higher implied volatility. They have higher premiums, SPLK and URI. But the third stock here has lower premiums. It's about 50% now, okay, 30% less. But the net credits are all the same and the strike differences are all the same because even though you're getting more for selling, you've got to pay more for the buying. So it balances out. So, when you ask about what is the best stock to use to control risk and maximize return, what we've been showing in those webinars is that, and you want to take a look at the uh, Beyond the Basics Part 1, where we talked about the bull put spreads. What we looked at is to be consistent long term, you want to shoot for this probability range of around 80, 85% or higher, because when you go 70 to 75%, you actually lose money long term. Even though you're getting a higher net credit, you might be looking at 30% returns, 40% returns, as opposed to 15, 12, or 11. But you need to be right 78% of the time. And what we've shown is when you look at the probabilities of 70 to 75%, you might only be right 71 or 72%, and that's a losing track record with that ratio. It's best to shoot in this range at 85 looking for returns around that 12 to 13% or so, 
don't try to look for the highest premium because remember if something has a highest premium on a call or put you got to buy a spread on it you're buying another option on it which simply means what simply means you're overpaying for that other one as well okay so that's my discussion there oh by the way the one really keen thing we found we've ran this search over a year got a positive return and it outperformed similar types of stocks but looking at a 70 75 percent probability or 75 to 80 percent probability you want to be 85 percent with the probability when I use that same criteria but I took out looking for stocks in an uptrend what showed as essentially um, a positive gain that matched reasonable expectations for bull put credit spreads return ended up being a 15 to 17 percent loss over the year you want to follow the trend you want stocks that are showing the same trend so I'm doing a bull put I want stocks in an uptrend I want to see some positive technicals and some good fundamentals too in addition to avoiding the earnings I probably want to see something that maybe has a good earnings per share growth has grown year over year in earnings and other information as well all right let me see here Sam I'm gonna get to your comments in just a moment Oh, this is dangerous. All right. Uh, it's not dangerous. It's a great question. It's from VP. VP says, how do I scan for high probability trades? For example, if I want to scan for high probability trades for all the stocks reporting earnings next week. All right, you can do that. I think it's a bad idea. Here's the reason why. Probabilities, deltas are all based on the past movement of the stock not anticipating could there be a sudden 10 15 20 percent swing due to a very poor earnings announcement or a very positive earnings announcement so when you talk about probabilities i'm assuming you're looking at things such as a bull put credit that we just talked about with that 85 percent probability which is of course a filter that you can look for or you're talking maybe debit spreads, the other vertical spreads VP, where you could set the probability. Maybe you're thinking about iron condors. So taking the bull put credit and the bear call credit side, hopefully going far enough out of the money that even if you're doing that, I apologize, even if you're going through the earnings, that even if there is an unexpected event, you won't hit the high or the low that is very dangerous because the delta you know you might say oh well probability of 85 applies to a short option delta of 0.20 or 0.15 or less and that is based on the expectation the delta of course the expectation of what the option price might change if the stock moves one point based on past movement of the stock not really future expectations so when you're going into earnings you could throttle through the probabilities in fact a lot of times I say to customers look when you're trying to trade something like that a directional trade or even an iron condor which is neutral but subtle directional through earnings you might as well just throw the probabilities out the window because nobody knows what is going to happen you know my biggest uh, earnings play last year was on buying a straddle uh, two years ago I think it was no, it was last year anyway it was on um, Red Robin or RGB and if you look back on the chart over a two-year period you'll see this one gigantic spike on the stock it happened against me this year with goose but I was in a married put trade I wasn't in an earnings straddle uh, trying to take advantage of it so I made on the married put but again I mean the stock I think went from 47 to 67 and almost hit 70 a day after the earnings um, it's the only two I've probably had like that in the last three years they were huge moves if I looked at goose before the earnings when it was trading at 47 and I sold a 65 so let's say even a 60 but probably more like a 65 67 and a half bear call credit spread VP I probably would have had a 98% probability maybe 95% probability the stock would stay below 62 and a half by expiration four days after the earnings that was proven wrong in an instant no not every stock shows those movements but that's the fear of probability it's based on the past 
not based on an event coming up where there can be zero predictions of movement. Yes, there's websites out there, there's, there's places out there that try to calculate, hey, over the last three years, uh, in these cycles, stock XYZ has moved up 7%, down 2%, for the next earnings up 5%, down 3%, up 6%, down 11 up 15 so we expect an average of a plus or minus 4% movement. Well, that's great, unless it's one of those times it hits the 11 or the 15% movement because something unexpected in that quarter and in that earnings. It's really a dangerous play. All of that being said, I'm not sure, again, if you're doing bull puts VP, I'm not sure if you're doing straddle, uh, selling straddles, selling strangles uh, in that case. Okay, I'm not sure. Um, but if you were, here's the simple thing you do. I, I, I'm going to highly advise against it, but let's say I wanted to do, I'm bullish on the market, I'm bullish on this quarter, I want to see some high probability bull put spreads with earnings coming up next week. Let's walk through it. First, I'm going to hit clear filters in my bull put search. I'm going to empty everything out of the criteria. I would never do this, but again, let's assume you, you meant next week, VP, so you're looking at the February uh, 1st or 2nd expiration. Uh, weekly expiration seven to eight days out in time. So I'd want to look for options that are maybe next week or maybe further out. Let's try next week. Set my expirations to be between, let's say, two. Now, I'll just do one and eight days out in time. I'll net credit, doesn't matter, uh, 20 cents. I want a 93% probability or higher on stocks that have an earnings between now and expiration. Let's just try those three criteria, match your needs. Next week's expiration. All right, so you've got Edwards Life Sciences. Ah. Uh, let me ch make one subtle change here, because it's using the midpoint, but I'm just going to put an option bit of greater than zero. There we go. Okay, Whirlpool, Juniper, ABC, Juniper at 2838. See, here's interesting. You could sell the 26 put, by the 25.50, that's a five-point spread I wouldn't do. At midpoint, you might get a 26 net credit. So it almost looks like a 104% return if you get midpoint. I should probably restrict that too. I'll show you that in a second. And it has a 95% probability based on what Juniper has done. You're 10% out of the money. If this has a 12 or 15% drop, you're at maximum loss on the position in one instant. Can't roll that. When you hit a 75, 80, even a 70% loss on a credit spread, there's no point to rolling it because you have to roll it out six months to try to repair it. Okay, that, that's not worth taking the risk in this case. Um, but that's how you would do it. You screen specifically for the expiration you want, maybe next week or maybe two weeks out in time, and then you look for stocks that have an earnings date between now and expiration. That's simply what Ernie and I do when we're looking at buying straddles or buying strangles, even though we know we're going to get implied volatility collapse or crush on it, if we get that large move, we can be profitable on the positions. Um, all right. And you say, Sam says Apple's earnings are on Tuesday. I don't think it came up here. Oh, yeah, there's 324 different trades here because I didn't do more restrictions. Um, let me try one result per security to limit that number down, Sam. Uh, I've got a lot in there, oh, but there's three pages, 43. Does Apple come up? Yep. So it's showing the 148, 146 with a net credit of 28 cents on a two-point spread. I like that. That looks like a good spread to me, but I never trade spreads through earnings. But this tool will find it if that's what you're looking for. And you would do the same structure in bear calls or even in iron condors if you want to do that. Or Sam's approach is different is is different as well. Sam says don't do spreads and earnings or buy the short before earnings. Um, E.g., you had a bull put in Apple in the money today and before market closed, then bought it back, made a profit, but did not do well. Okay, yeah, it's just it's not worth taking the risk with vertical spreads. And as again, you'd say, oh well, all these vertical spreads they must have a higher implied volatility, so I can get a better premium. If the short is overpriced, so is the long. You're in the same expiration cycle on the same stock. It's going to go back to what you'd think is normal. Now, this does seem a little bit high to me for a seven-day trade, but not out of bounds. 
this is what I'd look for in maybe my 14 day trades. 85, 88% probability, 15, 16% return, 23, 25 cent net credit on a two point spread. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Scott, to answer your question, yes. Uh, the weekly bull put defaults, you, you had asked, um, are the criteria you're talking about here? Yes, the weekly bull puts was the criteria we were talking about and we mentioned in the Beyond the Basics Part 1 discussing, and you can go back and watch that again, uh, Scott, because we discussed the returns that occurred on that without really managing the positions. In other words, just putting on the trades as they came up in the search, taking the top three and entering them uh, every cycle for the two-week spreads. A VP follow-up question, can we scan bull bear put call spreads for index, uh, indexes, SPX? Absolutely. I just showed you that by mistake in a sense. One of the tools here is you could go to fundamentals in any of the vertical spread searches we're talking about and you could screen just for a specific ETF or index to see if it matches your criteria. Now on power options, all of our indexes are uh, preceded by a dollar sign. So I'd have dollar sign SPX, dollar sign NDX, but the ETFs are the same, right? It'd be SPY, okay? Naturally, none are gonna appear if I submit this because it's stock, it doesn't have earnings. And that's one of the criteria we were looking for. And another way to do it is in the lists field, we give you the opportunity to select against anything you're tracking in your watch list. So you could create a watch list on the main tool on the main home tab here, you know, the watch list number one, two, three, four, five, go to watch list number four. Oh, there's nothing in there, I'm sorry. There's nothing in watch list number three, I'm sorry. So I could just add SPX, or I could add others. I could add NDX, remember everything preceded by this, I sign RUT, dollar sign RUT. Um, could it continue on that? I could even put SPY, QQQ, and IWM. I know I'm looking at the same exact things. It's, it's duplicates. Okay. So now I've created a watch list that contains the three that contains three of the five big indexes and three of the five big ETFs. I didn't I didn't put DJX in there, but you could put DJX or, or Dow symbols in there now. Oh, you could put SPX in there to SPXL in there too, Sam, as you mentioned, if you wanted to. Any symbols you want. Well, now I can go back to the search and I could go to lists. Okay, let me just submit that again. Let me clear the earnings feature out. Let me take that out of there. And we look for eight days out, 20 cent net credit, 93% probability, the strike difference I'm not going to use. But now, watch list number three. Okay, let me go ahead and submit that. And I'll show you another feature in a second, VP. There we go. So the only two that come up that have a 20 cent minimum net credit in the next seven days, and one of them is not seven days, of course it's six days, with a 93% probability are Russell and SPX. One on the Russell, one on the SPX. And you gotta say there's gotta be more spreads there that offer 20 cent net credit. You're probably right. They just don't have a 93% probability. Or there are many other spreads that have more than a 93% probability. They're not offering you a 20 cent net credit minimum at midpoint. All right, let's go back to the list. At any time, you can also just simply create your own list if you wanted to. So you can go to create and modify lists. This shows, here's, you know, I have one here, ETFs and ETNs to remove, ETFs to remove from a standard search, meaning it's a combination of inverse and um, uh, ultras, for example. Uh, my watch list here as well. So I can even, there's only the six there that I added. In watch list number three, I can just click edit. And I can just copy and paste symbols here if I want to add more in and update and save the list. So you can do that on the fly again in that list field. You can create your own personal list here or combine lists that you've created. So just click create and modify lists. It'll take you to that other page. Okay. So that's what you can do there at any time. All right. Oh, Scott, um, I'm going to address this question real quick. Uh, I don't have the slides here, uh, as I mentioned. Um, get to that in a moment. 
Uh, bu -bu -bu. Oh, I'm sorry. Bull put credit. Oh, let's go back test. You know, bull put credit. I'm going to go to the back test real quick. So we're going to do a bull put credit. We're going to do 23rd. Let's go to the 9th. Watch this Watch this. make fun of me here. I'm going to go to the 9th for uh, the other day. No, it wouldn't have been the 9th. Yeah, let's go to the 9th. Okay? That doesn't make sense. I apologize. Let's go to the 7th. So on January 7th, if I ran this weekly bull put search that I talked about, that we showed the results during that webinar. And what we did is we took a $100,000 account and allocated it to bull put spreads. But we only allowed ourselves to allocate 20% of that account into spread trading. And there's, Scott, you know the specific reason why. Some of those criteria I mentioned, looking for positions that had a 30% return with only a 70, 71% probability over the course of 2018, you would have gone bankrupt, believe it or not. I know this because only allocating $20,000, the account hit a low value of about $61,000, meaning I was I only started with $20,000. I had to borrow from other portions of my portfolio to continue trading to get back to break even. Had I invested 50 to 60% of my portfolio, I would have wiped all of that out and then had to borrow and still ended up with about a 90% loss. With a 20% allocation of the total portfolio, you still end up with 40% of your portfolio declining with those higher numbers. So, Here's the results that would have matched if I ran this search and uh, January 9th, no, January 7th, 2019, following the bull put weekly that we were discussing, five TIFF and CMG, and it was for the expiration on January 18th, standard expiration would have been two weeks away. I'm going to hit calculate group results there, let's see what we get. Now watch, these are all going to be losers just to put egg in my face, but that's why we have these webinars and that's why we look at these tests to see what does and does not work. So while that's doing that, I'm going to answer your uh, other question there. So we took, for the bull put spreads, we took a $100,000 account with the bull put weekly screen. We allocated only $20,000 to the top three results that matched our criteria, or roughly 6.6% .6 of the entire portfolio was allocated to each bull put spread. We ran it from January 1st, 18, to December 29th of 18. Yes, yeah, somewhat 29th of 2018. The ending account value with just the bull put weeklies with no stops was the portfolio was at 109,985 or something like that. Okay, so you can only say this is only a 10% return on your portfolio. Or is it a 49.9% return on what you invested into the position? Meaning, I was only ever using 20,000. I made 9,958 off the 20,000 I allocated for proper position sizing. So, yeah, it only made 10% profit in my portfolio, but it was 49.9%. When I added just a simple stop, if the stock was less than the short put strike price, we had an increased average return from 14% to 15.6%, and we managed to minimize the losers, the, the amount we lost in losers, instead of 99, we dropped it down to only 52. Using just that simple stop, the account was 114,568. So you could say, well, you only gained 15% on spreads over the course of the year? Or was it 74% or so of the $20,000 you allocated as well? Um, and so that's what the results were, and you can see that written out in that webinar of part one, Beyond the Basics part one, okay? All right, so anyway, that's what we showed, and then we showed the stops were important, but remember what I also told you, we showed that if I just use that same criteria of the 85% probability, which performed better than the 75% probability, and we're looking for that 8 to 14 days out, which outperformed just going 7 days out in time, 
but I removed the stock criteria, what was a gain became a loss. The stock criteria is just as important, and I've done numerous iterations of that over time. All right, so the top three trades would have had five, TIFF, and CMG, all maximum profit, 21%, 16.6, 16.3, as they expired on January 18. Now, I don't know if they would have hit a stop during the course. I could check that using the analyzed position, but that's what would have happened historically. If I'd have opened three bull puts on January 7, 2019, it would have come from that list. Um, these would have likely been the three trades I entered. Those would have likely been the returns. You guys heard me say two weeks ago that I was really not doing any credit spreads right now at the beginning of the year until I got a little bit more confidence in the direction of the market and certain things going on. I'm getting that now. And of course, you heard me say, many of you might have heard me say live that one of the things I was looking for was to see any kind of headway instead of bickering with the government shutdown. And we saw some headway today. So I have a feeling on Monday, I may be opening two or three bull put credit spreads going forward. Unless the market opens extremely down from some other news. Okay. Uh, VP follow-up question. Um, do you guys keep a track uh, success rate? No, we don't. The tools on power options are really designed um, because everyone, as you can tell from these webinars, has their own ideas, their own risk reward tolerance and, and their own management process of what they want to use. So these powerful tools, as we just saw with the search, you have ability to look for anything. If you want to look for stocks that have earnings between now and expiration have a high probability, you can do that. Or if you just wanted to look for spreads that had a high probability for stocks that don't have an earnings date, or you did want a certain implied volatility, or a certain delta, a certain earnings per share growth, if you use Bollinger Bands, RSI, MACD, so forth. We're giving you the tools so you can effectively customize this any way you want to to find just the option strategies that match your needs. We do offer default criteria, and I do tests at the beginning of each year and share them in webinars to let you know, hey, how exactly did this work? Would it have been worth your while? Are we just full of it or are we showing something? So I show it we're showing something. And if I find a better approach that has worked better, uh, in the covered calls, in the naked puts, bull put spreads, bear calls were very difficult, believe it or not. Uh, even with last year's track record, last year's trading uh, charts, you know, look at SPY over the course of the last year, you say you'd have to make money on bear spreads. It was very difficult to make money on the uh, bear call credit spreads in that situation. Um, it really was. So, yes, we show them. We don't show a track record. I don't actually enter all of these trades on a consistent basis because we're not trying to be an advisory service. But we're, what we are showing you is we're giving you ideas. Mike, what would you, where would you start right now if you were going to open new bull puts? It's right here. If you called me up for a coaching session and said, what would you do if you were opening bull puts right now? What would you look for if you're opening bear calls? This is the search I would select from, maybe make a couple changes based on market conditions, but that's it. All right, so we don't keep a track record there as well. Scott, a uh, common question that comes in, um, have you considered using a DI indicator or have you considered using um, another common question Scott didn't ask is, uh, why don't you use Fibonacci? Why don't you use this? I could look into it, um, but the reason is I've been able to meet my goals with this without making it more complicated. Um, I haven't looked at DI at all, to tell you the truth. I bet you anything I could do might enhance this further, but if it's already meeting my goals for what I'm doing in my portfolio, I feel that I don't necessarily need to change it, but I could be doing better. You're absolutely right. And I'll take a look at that because you suggested it, but I don't know if we'll be able to implement it, and I don't know uh, if it would improve the results or not. Okay, let's let's go back a second here. I'm going to go back to some of this ratio idea for Jerry. It's not really a ratio idea, but it's a it's a different concept. Let's walk through this slowly. Uh, this might not even be as complicated as the ratio spreads we were talking about earlier, but uh, Jerry had another thought uh, a little while ago while we were in our discussion. I'm going to try to use Starbucks again just because we're familiar with it and we're familiar, Jerry, that it worked with the other strategy, uh, the ratio spreads. So... 
Jerry comments, this is, say you bought a long call and want to bring in some cash. So you buy one higher call option and then sell the two the next higher calls, which is a credit. Later, the stock increases greatly. Then your two short calls are in the money and cost a lot to buy back. How do you adjust? I don't is going to be my answer. Think about what we're saying. Let's say back when Starbucks, um, uh, let me look at another view here. I apologize. I don't usually like to switch over the screens that fast, but let me just go back here. I want to go to the quotes page for Starbucks. I know it's a 67. I want to look at a chart here. I don't think I'm going to use the historical tools. I'm just going to guess. Yeah, that's where I want it. That's where I want it, mid-January. Now, January 10th. Okay, so let me go to the chain now for January 10th. Let's say on January 10th, stock should be around 60. Now, it's up 31. Let me go back a day. I'm really sorry. I thought I gauged that right. 63.88. All right, we're just going to pause there at whatever date this is. January 7th, 63.57. Okay, and I'm going out to February 1st. All right, so let's say that on 1.7.19, we bought a 63 call for February 1st expiration at 2.28. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, that's bad. 2.40, midpoint. 240. Kind of expensive. Let's say we bought the at the money call. Three days later, the stock moved up to 64 now. Not a lot. Let's go one more day, okay? Is it hot? Please tell me it's higher the next day. Ah, bummer. Okay, let me go back. That's all right. It's all right. The stock moves up again. It goes to 64.19. So I'm going to buy this at about $2. The 64 at $2. Same expiration. <laughs> and then now... Okay, now I've got to sell two higher calls here. See, I can't because this was, the 63 was at two something, this was at two something. When I sell the two higher ones, um, that's not going to give me a credit on the entire position. It's going to be difficult to get a credit on the entire position after the stock's moving. But let's just do that. 65 is at 150. Okay. So anyway, this isn't going to be done at a credit, unfortunately, because of the cost. If I got something at a lower price and it gapped up, it might have been that. So we bought a 63 at 2 something, 40. That was expensive. Later on, we bought a 64 as the stock moved up for 2 even. And then we're going to say we sold two 65s. at 150. So I'm only taking in three, but I paid out four. Here's the thing, Jerry. You're talking about these ratio spreads and these ideas um, uh, of, of doing these two to ones. It's not really two to one here. Um, you're not looking at it sort of a ratio here at all. This isn't a ratio spread. This is simply two bull call debit spreads, a 63.65 and a 64.65 with a total cost basis of $1.40 with a potential to make $1.60. Don't, don't think of this as a ratio. It's not. Don't think of it as a butterfly. You, you just have two bull call debits, and you could call it two laddered bull call debits. What's my goal in the bull call debit? To have the stock trade above the two short strike prices for the maximum profit on both debit spreads. It's achieved its goal. Why would I roll it? I wouldn't roll it. I'd let it go to assignment, buy stock at 63, sell it at 65, get two points back, buy stock at 64, sell it at 65, get one point back, get three points in on a cost of 140, make 160 on a 140. I wouldn't roll this. I wouldn't even consider rolling it. If I like Starbucks and I think it's going to go up, I'm going to take my 160 profit off my 140 investment, 
That's not 20 cents. That's a full 160. I got three dollars back on a 140 debit. So I made a dollar 60 paying out a dollar 40. So I made 114 percent return on the position. If I still like Starbucks and it's here, okay. Maybe I'm selling a February 15th 67 and buying a February 15th 65 to do just another bull call debit spread. Why roll all of this? You hit maximum profit. Take the maximum profit. Look for new positions that match your criteria as well. So that's how I, I wouldn't manage it. And I would not consider when, you, when you're talking about laddering into these positions like this, you bought a call, then you buy another call and they sell too higher. Don't think of this as a ratio. Break it down into its simplest components. Simplest components are you have two bull call debit spreads. And what is the goal of a bull call debit spread? Maximum profit at expiration. Whether this is at 70 or 72, I don't care. Or if it's at 65, 10, I don't care. I'm not going to try to roll these. I'm going to take the maximum profit, move on if I still like Starbucks for that kind of strategy, and then go on from there. Wouldn't worry about the buyback cost. Not in the stock position. I'm, I'm not trying to protect the stock. Um, I'm in a bull call debit spread. It did exactly what I wanted it to. I've more than achieved my goals out of the trade going forward into the next positions after expiration. All right, so yeah, there was a couple issues here I may have to address in this webinar before we post it. I know many of you have commented the screen wasn't changing. That wasn't my fault. That might be related to the same issue I had while trying to log on when it wouldn't pull up the platform for me after I got the computer up. The volume apparently was working, but the screen was not showing or changing for that matter. Sam also commented at the very beginning of the webinar he had a problem getting in today. Um, which he has never had before, and I had a subtle problem as well. So I do apologize for that, and I'm probably going to have to edit that middle portion of this webinar, or I'm going to take out our topic of discussion on the ratio spreads and butterflies since the screen wasn't changing, it looks like at that time, and I'm just going to re-record the whole thing using the audio as a script and just redo it with screenshots and post two webinars this weekend or on Monday for you, one with our discussion on ratios converting to butterflies and broken, and then everything else we discussed after that. Uh, Sam, uh, another great comment here. You said, you have a straddle at 64. Sold the calls and puts and sold the 65 for next week. I think you meant bought the calls and puts at 64 and sold the 65 for next week. Should be interesting to see what happened. I used an income method number four by married put position. I mean, that, that's, yeah, the Starbucks position. Um, for the radioactive uh, portfolio, you know, I had the 70 put originally, the stock fell down that 61 level. I moved down the put and lowered my cost basis by about six points on the trade and kept the risk even about 6%. The stock moved to 67 today. I was only at a loss of 0.2%. I paid 67.15 for the stock and I think 790 for the 70 put when I got into it. Right now I'm essentially at a loss of about 08 0.9%. Um, with a stock only at 67.09, much below my initial cost basis and well below, a little bit below my initial purchase price. Uh, but yeah, I rolled the put up today from 65 to 67.5, cut the risk down to 4%, and I'm still out beyond April, so I have plenty of time to make other adjustments. I can't lose more than 6% on that as well. Oh. Sam just wants to make sure that I'm aware that he's doing better than me. His cost in Starbucks is $49 on 200 shares in addition to the earning straddles he's playing around it. Fantastic. Fantastic. I guess you're at close to a 45, 44% gain now. That's 20. No, oh, no, no, it's not quite. I'm sorry. You're 18 points up. Good, good, good. Okay, so we're, we're in that 35, 38% profit range on just the stock shares alone, which doesn't include the other positions you're profiting on now with that straddle perhaps also. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, uh, the slides did not come up. I had them up and I had made the changes for Jerry's questions and some other things. And then it got lost when the computer had the issue. And then the delay with getting into GoToWebinar today, which hopefully will not happen next week on Friday or anywhere else as well. Um, I haven't scheduled any webinars for next week, but I can guarantee you there will be webinars likely on Wednesday afternoon. Friday afternoon at 4.30, once again, hopefully it'll go more smoothly for us. Um, 
And in addition to that, we'll probably have presentations on Tuesday as well, plus other archived webinars to be posted. Um, I just want to remind everyone that you can check out our free webinars at any time. Just go to powerup.com slash webinars.asp. That is a public page. You can access it any time. Those bold put discussions we had about the criteria, here it is, credit spreads beyond the basics part one, where we looked at how that bold put weekly and other ideas, other bold put spreads would have worked uh, in 2018 as a comparison with no management at all. And here, how to be successful with spread trades. That's from August of 2017. That's where I also show the results of what determined for me to go to the uh, bull put weekly screen that was created a few years back and continue to use it was because we showed the record of trading it for 2015, 16, and 17. Now we've shown it for 18, so you can get a perfect gauge of how the bull put weekly would have performed uh, over that time as well. Of course, in addition to that, Ideas on the Power Options tools, we saw a lot today on screening for positions that have earnings coming up or don't have earnings coming up. How to screen for positions where we've seen an increase in option volume uh, beyond the average, a higher percentage above the average, in addition to seeing how we could screen for stocks uh, using Power Options that had a high volume or a high percentage volume compared to its average, in addition to look at briefly at volatility and others as well. Uh, in addition to that, Scott just put in a last moment question, and his last minute question uh, was, could you, I know you're about to close, but could you, could you tell us how you would look for calls trading under 30 cents? Exactly. One thing you have to answer for yourself, Scott, that I can't is what time frame, okay? Um, that's always important. So here's what I would do. I'm going to put in long call. I'm going to go into the long call search. Okay, and then and you didn't specify if you wanted to look for cheap calls that have earnings coming up sometime in the near future or if you're just looking for anything below 30 cents. So what I do is go into long call. As we did before, I'm going to clear the filters. I'm going to set an expiration time frame. I could just select February, or I could set all expirations as we did before, and I might go one to eight, two to nine days out of time, so I'm just looking for next week's expiration. But I'm going to take that out and I am just going to look at February, okay? Uh, less than 30 cents, so in the option ask price field, just put less than 0 0.30, and there's gonna be a ton of them, thousands of them, maybe tens of thousands, possibly even 100,000. Anything that's so deep out of the money that has a bit of zero and an ask of 10 would appear in this search. So that's why I said you've gotta set some other things. You might want to see something that has some volume recently, maybe a little bit of open interest as well. Um, you may want to look not necessarily for delta, uh, but look for something that you know has at least a bid price or, or a small bid price. And you might want to look for something that has a lower percent bid ask spread, so it's not too wide. You're not looking at something that has a 30 cent. Well, no, in this case, I'm looking for the ask, so you wouldn't have to do that. If this was just a midpoint or the bid, I'd say, yeah, what you want to make sure is not that the bid is $0.10 cents and the ask is $2. But since we're looking at the ask, the widest range you'd see is a bid of 0 to an ask of 30. Okay? All right. But we want to put some volume and open interest, make sure it's more actively traded and active as well. And you know, I don't know how far out of the money you would want to go. Maybe something 25% out of the money for you is too far out of the bounds. It's a possibility. So I could put that in. I don't, I'm sorry. I want to be less than 25% out of the money. All right, let's see what we've got. 400, NVGS at 949. We'll see you there, the stock that's right at the money. Uh, Hess, 5310, the February 15th, 62 and a half is at 12 cents. Uh, JD.com, 23.63, the 27 and the 28 are below your mark. Um, so you, so now you're probably saying to yourself, oh, well, I want stocks with X, and I, no, I, I want options that are closer to the strike price instead of being more than two strikes out. Then set set what you want. You, Scott didn't say that. I'm just saying that when you see this, you know, he's looking for something for anything under 30 cents. That's the simple criteria. Option ask less than 30. Set a single expiration time frame put in some volume and open interest to make sure it's actively traded, it's not just something that's junk that's so deep out of the money it hasn't traded in two months. 
and you can do that. But again, if you're playing earnings, you know, I could say I want earnings between now and expiration or avoid earnings between now and expiration, your choice. But again, you might want to set some other criteria here. But if you're looking at this list and saying, now I wanted something that was closer than just restrict it, lower it down, take it down to 15. Is there anything that's less than 15% of the money that's less than 30 cents? We take it down to 324. Might still be too much, but you might again be looking for specific things. Underlying stock price, um, stocks over at least ten dollars, for example, or fifteen dollars. You just plug that in. Let me try it real quick while we're here. Stock price greater than fifteen. Taking it down to two. So we're minimizing it and lowering it and lowering it based on what your needs are. But your three main criteria, Scott, were your first, your expiration that you want. Option ask less than 30, put in some volume and open interest to make sure they're active, and then start filtering with the range out of the money. And if this is to be an earnings play or not an earnings play, check that box appropriately for what you're looking at as well. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Usually we have a wrap-up slide here. I just want to remind everyone, if you haven't done so yet, just go to powerop.com. If you haven't taken a 14-day free trial, you haven't tested out our services, go to powerop.com, put in your first name, last name, and email address, and click Start My Trial. And you'll have full access to the site for 14 days. Take a look at these searches, the archived webinars, uh, as well as other information. And of course, you'll have access to the uh, help lines, of course. You can call myself or Ernie at any time, send us an email. And, of course, schedule a coaching session during your trial. No credit card needed. First name, last name, email address. Go to PowerUp.com. Remember, you can check out those webinars at any time. PowerUp.com slash webinars.asp. All of our Friday sessions are here in the requested topics section. We have another section on options concepts and, of course, options strategies, which we talked about, and the tools section as well. And we'll let you know when these webinars are archived. And I will also let you know um, of any upcoming webinars next week as well. Thank you for bearing with me today between the technical difficulties um, that we had. Next week, I promise, will be much cleaner. I hope to see you all very soon again on one of our live presentations. Sam, great to see you. Take care. Have a great weekend as well. Scott, thank you for your questions. Bruce, thank you for your questions. And Jerry, thank you for your questions as well. Talking into those ratios, sometimes it's, it's hard to keep track because you get around in circles um, going from one ratio to the next. But uh, yeah, I got a lot of work to do here for you guys to uh, put some presentations together that were requested. We'll get to that, and I'll let you know when all those webinars and videos are available. Take care, everyone. Have a fantastic evening. We'll see you soon. Good night.